So in our theme of innovation in the classroom, in the laboratory, and across the world, we're now going to move into our series of wonderful presentations. And I've asked my colleagues uh, to introduce the presenters. So I'm going to start by asking Karen Gill to introduce our first set of presentations. Thank you, Karen. Good morning, Chancellor. Very excited to have this opportunity to talk with you about the ways we are transforming undergraduate teaching and learning in the College of Arts and Sciences. And thank you very much, Chair Caudill and Chancellor and uh, Trustee Powell, for already putting our panel in context. You've all seen the uh, exciting uh, national media recognizing this work that we are doing here at Chapel Hill. Terms like active learning and flipping the classroom are really buzzwords are in higher education right now, as our universities across the nation are really looking at ways to improve student learning and, importantly, improve student learning outcomes. Um, I recognize that we had a real opportunity to be a leader in this area because some of our instructors were already using innovative techniques and technologies in their classrooms. And in September of 2012, I charged a task force in the college to make recommendations on how to transform our large lecture classes, the gateway courses, to many of our majors. We had a real motivation to do this in science courses, but we really took it as an opportunity to look across the college at all of the disciplines in the fine arts and humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences. And the recommendations really have important uh, implications for not only large lecture gateway courses, but l courses large and small. Today's presenters are Professor Mike Crimmins and Kelly Hogan. They chaired this task force uh, several years ago. In addition, another part of the story is that in 2013, Carolina was selected to be one of eight universities by the Association of American Universities to be a site for a three-year grant aimed at improving undergraduate education in STEM fields. This was a great honor and a, a very exciting for us. This spring, we presented our findings to the AAU on how we have transformed large lecture courses in biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, Dr. Mike Crimmins is the principal investigator of Carolina's AAU grant. He is also the Mary Ann Smith Distinguished Professor of Chemistry in the college, and he's been a member of the faculty for over 30 years. In the past, he served as chair of chemistry. He was also the senior associate dean for the natural sciences in the college on my team from 2009 to 2013. A wonderful part of this story is that he used the opportunity of returning to the classroom after serving in the dean's office to reimagine, re redesign, reinvent his courses using some of these new methods, and you'll hear from him uh, in a minute. Also earlier this year, I named Dr. Kelly Hogan, who is the senior STEM lecturer in biology, as the college's first director of instructional innovation. She will be working with faculty across the college and with the Center for Faculty Excellence to promote and implement new teaching techniques and technologies. Kelly has really been a campus leader in getting faculty to rethink the classroom experience. Next month, she'll be leading a hands-on workshop to incorporate a variety of teaching methods in the curriculum. These will include high-tech as well as low-tech strategies that can make our classrooms more engaging, experiential, and effective. We, you've already heard from others that her recent study on how active learning in large science classes benefits students. In particular, her findings show that black students and first-generation college students showed remarkable improvements. The story's been covered in the national media, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, and many other outlets. Joining uh, Mike uh, Crimmins and Kelly Hogan today, we have three students who will share their experiences uh, on uh, some of the classes they've been in. I'm going to let Mike and Kelly take over now. I just want to ask and uh, say uh, I hope you all did your homework because I understand there will be a quiz. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Karen. And uh, good morning, Chancellor Folt, Chairman Caudill, and all the trustees. First of all, thank you so much for inviting us to be here to tell you some about the work that we're, we've been doing in redesigning science courses and the work that we've started to do to translate these active learning methods across the faculty. And so we wanted to give you some kind of a sense of what it's like to be in the classroom in Carolina now in some of these redesigned classes. And so we provided you with a pre-class assignment, this video you were supposed to watch. And if you're good students, you watch the video. And now you're going to have a quiz, OK? So we're going to pass out the clickers. All right, so if I could have the first slide, if I get the advancer here. Okay, so, all right, a, a little decorum in the classroom, please. <laughs> all right, so uh, here's your first question, and I've got to get it set up, and so bear with me because I'm not used to quite doing it this way. Let me go forward here. Ah, here we go. So we need eight. Okay. So this is, this is somewhat what you, like what you're going to see in the classroom. Well, you're not allowed to go to sleep because you have to participate. Okay, so you've all got your clickers, and some of the folks in the audience also have a clickers. So just push the letter on the, the clicker that corresponds to the answer that you want to give. You can only vote once, but if you can change your you can change your answer if you like. You can punch it again and change your answer. Okay, so I can see from my iPhone that there are now 30 responses that have been entered, and there's a significant split in the answers on this question. And so what I want you to do is turn to your neighbor and discuss this with them and try to convince them that your answer is right. And if you didn't watch the video and in the audience especially, try to find somebody that did so you can talk to them about it. So go ahead and talk about it and see if you can get, come up with the answer. All right, so All right, so okay everybody, we're going to run the now we're going to run the poll again, okay? So let's start it up again here. All right, so sorry about that. But anyway, let me just tell you that the the first poll it was about 25% across four or five different answers, 20 or 25% across four or five different answers. And presumably you all talked about this and it coalesced much more closely on one answer because as I walked around the room, I heard people saying that it was E. And the answer is E, it's 40%. So only 40% of the students nationally who intend to get a STEM degree when they enter college actually get a STEM de degree. So now let me ask you what you think it is at Carolina. And let's see if I can make it work this time. And if I can't, we'll just play it by ear. OK. Oh, so it's working again now, of course. All right. So you can see we've got up to almost 20 responses. So those of you who fell asleep, you need to wake up and put your answer in, OK? All 
right, looks like some of you gave up. So let's just take a look and see what it looks like in terms of your answers. And we can't see it on the side there, but I'll tell you that it's um, Sixty percent, there it is, sixty percent of you think it's D, okay, D, and what was that one? Let's get rid of that. And the answer is actually D. It's about 55 percent of the students in Carolina actually graduate with a STEM degree, of the ones who enter wanting to get a STEM degree. So we're doing better than the national average, but we're still not doing as well as we need to. And so I'm going to turn this over to, to Kelly and let her give you the next question. Hello, everyone. So we like to use technology when it helps us. And one of, the, just going to hold this up. one of the things we like to do with technology is not just simply ask people to memorize things in science, right? So we like to see them apply and use higher levels of thinking. So this next question gets at that a bit. What do you think should be the success rate of earning degrees for students intending to major in a STEM field at Carolina, and why? So we've given you some choices to center your discussion around. And we're going to walk around, and we will do this like a classroom as well, where once you've had a chance to discuss, we will randomly be calling on you to share what you've been discussing. All right, so we're going we're gonna to hear from um, one group, and I listened in on one group, so I'm going to let them share. She's our spokesperson. <laughs> this is what students do. They don't want the microphone. <laughs> but you do make them comfortable in the classroom when they get used to this environment. So. <laughs> Okay, about 60%. So I think that's a really good example that there doesn't have to be a right answer when you use technology, but it, what it really sparks is some great discussion where people have to explain and justify what they're thinking. So useful in a lot of disciplines. So what I want to show you now are some data from my own course and tell you a little bit about what I did in the classroom. And what you see on the left-hand side here are some data from Biology 101, which is a large gateway course in biology. I'm one of two instructors that teach this. These data were from 2007, 2008. And um, it was these data that really woke me up to, this was a problem at UNC and not just a national problem. And this wasn't just a problem at UNC, this was a problem in my course. And when I saw these data, 
I knew that we had a problem with failures, but when I looked at the data that were disaggregated, if you look at the green bars, what you'll see are African American students, and if you look at the purple bars on the right, you'll see white Asian students, and you see a huge gap here. What this really represents is about one in three of our African American students were getting Ds or Fs in this course, which means they were being excluded from continuing on in science. So this in combination with technology that was ready to go, in combination with national workshops I had been to, ready to make some changes, clear about what evidence was telling us about how students learn, I decided to redesign and reimagine my course over the course of one summer. So prior to fall 2010, I had primarily been lecturing three exams and a final, and that's very typical in a science course and has been tradition for a long time. What I wanted to move towards was a high structure active learning format where students come prepared for class. It's not enough to expect that they come to class prepared. There needs to be some accountability, right? And the way we can do that in the classroom is to assign points and to set our expectations high that it's done and we will be moving on as if every single person in that classroom has done that reading. We do that with um, pre-class guided reading assignments. We don't assume all students know how to use their textbook effectively, so they answer questions and learn what they need to focus on. They answer homework questions, so pre-class reading assessments. Clicker questions like you've been doing in the classroom, once they're there, they're prepared and ready to go so we can use higher level thinking questions. We use undergraduate mentors in the classroom and they also run help session four times a week and one of those students is here with me today. Um, in class problem solving activities, modeling, drawing, peer discussing. The key point here is that I'm no longer lecturing at them when I'm talking. I'm summarizing and explaining something that began with a question. These are data once we have made the change to this higher structured classroom that I think are pretty impressive. If you could take a student, the same identical student from my class several years ago to a class that's resembling the high structure now, if you could put that student who would in this case be a first generation student in the low versus the high, so the gray versus the black bar, you'd see that student would have gained significantly in terms of exam points. So we're looking at achievement here. If you could take a student that was a continuing generation student, so the student on the right, the two bars on the right, you would also see a gain there. But I ask you, what else do you notice about this graph? If you look at the two black bars, Andrew? Very similar, and what that shows us is that we no longer have an achievement gap between our first generation students and our continuing generation students in a couple of semesters of doing this kind of transformational teaching. We also disaggregated the data by race and ethnicity since those were data that initially made me really think, rethink my teaching. And you can see here, the black students are gaining in achievement much more than the white students. And once again, this represents a cutting of the achievement gap, it represents a halving in this case. So pretty significant gains quickly. So to summarize, all students are gaining, that's an important point to make, by 3.2 to 3.7%, but some of our students, our first generation and our black students, are gaining disproportionately. If we're ever gonna close achievement gaps, we need to see this disproportionate gain. I also don't wanna leave out Latino students and even Native American students, which we did look at. They are also gaining because they are part of all students. We are not seeing a disproportionate gain for those students and it's something we wanna to continue to investigate. Thanks, Kelly. So as a result of some of this really encouraging early work by Kelly Hogan and also some really encouraging work in the Department of Physics uh, around a really innovative studio model that they've implemented in their introductory physics courses, that information combined with some information we got from the task force in 2012, 2013 that Karen mentioned allowed us to submit a proposal to the Association of American Universities back in the spring of 2013. And that proposal was funded last year and it's now allowing us to expand this, this active learning program into 
uh, along the lines of what we've done, but also across the faculty. So the, the goal of the AAU project was to do two main things. One was to transition or to continue to transition our introductory large lecture format courses in biology, chemistry, and physics. And a total of 11 courses in those three departments have now been redesigned to a more active learning, student-centered format. And not only that, but to try to translate these active learning methods across the faculty. And so as a, a way to do that, we've created what we call a mentor-apprentice program where experienced faculty and using active learning methods work with inexperienced faculty who have never used active learning methods before. And oftentimes this, this pairing of mentor-apprentice is a lecturer or a senior lecturer who knows much more about this with a more seasoned or uh, old faculty member who's never done this before. And so this is sort of an unusual pairing in some cases, but it's been, at least to this point, pretty effective. The other aspect of what we've done is to implement this, the, the project itself has funded course release time for the faculty who are learning how to do this and implementing it for the first time. And we've also introduced department level and college level faculty learning communities where the faculty who are doing this kind of work come together to talk about methods, uh, best practices, and not just within the department but across disciplines to try to get better ideas about how to teach in a more effective way. So I was the very first apprentice in this program and I worked with Dr. Jen Crumper to redesign introductory organic chemistry, chemistry 261. And if you looked at the data from the failure rates in introductory science courses back in 2007 and 2008, this one right here in the middle with the highest bar was organic chemistry one, chemistry 261. You can see that all students had a failure rate of nearly 20% in this course. And black African-American students, the failure rates were more than 40%. And so this course had the reputation of being the major weed-out course for science students at Carolina. And still, to some extent, holds that uh, characteristic, but we're trying to change that. So as a part of this AAU project, we, Jen Crumper and I, worked together to redesign Chemistry 261. And before the redesign, it was what I call rock on rock, chalk on the blackboard, calcium carbonate on slate. It was stand in front of the classroom and talk, 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 and the students would doze off about 10 minutes in. It was either that or PowerPoints and lecture. And we did a number of things to try to make this a better course. Uh, we tried to move it more toward a high structure active learning format that Kelly has mentioned. And to do that, we did a number of things. One of the first things that we did was to record approximately 80 topical videos for this course. There are individual videos of five to 15 minutes which cover specific topics within the course that students can view either before the course, sorry, before the lecture or after the lecture or both. And so when I teach this course, I give students the opportunity to either look at the video, read the book, or do both of those before they come to class. And then when they get to class, they take a, a short quiz at the beginning of class to make sure that they've been held accountable for the work that they were supposed to do before they came to class. We have a number of undergraduate mentors roaming around the classroom when we present our clicker questions and do discussions around the clicker questions. And the undergraduate mentors facilitate the discussion because these are students that have performed at a high level in this course before. So in class, we do clicker questions, we do problem solving, and we do a little bit of lecture, but as Kelly mentioned, it's more like summarizing and explaining than standing in front and just talking. And so as a result of this, we, we started this last fall. The first time it was taught uh, under the redesign format was last fall. Prior to the redesign, here's what the final exam scores looked like in the course in 2002 and 2003. You'll note that it ranges all the way from about 20% up to 90%. There's very few scores in the 90s on this final exam. The averages are in the low 60s. And more interestingly, or maybe not interestingly, but uh, 
something that jumps out at you here is if you look at the blue bar, that's almost bimodal. And if you look at the red one, it's almost bimodal. So there's some relatively high performing students, but a lot of students who have fallen behind. And it's a very, very broad graph. In the redesigned uh, courses in two, fall of 2013 and fall, spring of 2014, you'll see the graph at the bottom for the final exam. There's no bimodal nature to this graph at all. It's more like a real bell curve. And the, there's a significant movement from the lower end toward the higher end. Now there are a reasonable number of students in the 90s and quite a few in the high 80s. And if you overlay this data on the right-hand side, you can see the active learning redesign group jumping out on the right-hand side at the high end. And so either six years in administration made me a better teacher or this is working. And so uh, Kelly's going to tell you now just a little bit about uh, the effect of this on failure rates. So if we come back to the idea of retention nationally, if you watch the video, we spoke a lot about President Obama's call for a million new STEM graduates over the next decade. The only way we're going to reach that is to increase retention nationally. And what we can say, what we're doing at UNC, these are just two examples of courses. Keep in mind there's a lot of other stuff going on. But 101 in biology, we see a 40% reduction to date in failure rates. So those are students that wouldn't have been able to continue on in science. And in Chem 261, which is Mike's course, we have some early results showing that it's probably about 50% or even greater than that so far. So combined with some of the really other exciting um, initiative and programs going on related to STEM education, um, I think we have a chance to be a leader in STEM education. And coincidentally, I'm on my way to DC this afternoon for another STEM education meeting where um, national agencies are recognizing that not only are we leading, but we're seeing a big change in culture around some of these initiatives. So. And the last thing I need to do is to acknowledge the fact that it's not just Kelly and I that are doing this work. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of people behind this effort. Uh, the Center for Faculty Excellence has been extremely important in this effort in terms of supporting the faculty learning communities and their efforts on starting the 100 plus program several years ago really kick-started some of these redesign efforts. So we have to thank them for their efforts in this area and their continued support of the program. I also need to give my sincere thanks to both the College of Arts and Sciences and the Provost's Office for funding now I believe it's seven STEM lecturers in the sciences. We brought in some really talented young STEM lecturers that know how to do these active learning methods and they're translating this information across the faculty and they're really uh, extremely important in this effort. Also, the Office of Institutional Research for the data that we need to really do this in a scientific way. Without this data, we're just sort of shooting in the dark. So we want to really do evidence-based teaching. We want to make a change, measure the difference, and see if that change is working or not. And to do that, we really need strong support from the Office of Institutional Research. And Lynn Williford and her staff has been extremely helpful in that area. And then finally, I need to thank the faculty of both of the Department of Biology, Chemistry, and Physics and Astronomy for all their hard work in this effort and the efforts that are ongoing. And particularly Lori McNeil, who's not with us today, has been an extremely influential person in developing active learning on this campus and nationally in uh, physics. So I think now we're going to have our students come and tell you about their experience in this effort. And we have three students with us this morning. Come on up. Sarah, and I'm sorry, Sarah, I don't even know your last name. McShane, okay. Dennis Mitchell, and Tatiana Blunt. And these two on the right were in my, Dennis is currently in my organic chemistry class, and Tatiana was in my organic chemistry class last fall. Unfortunately, Sarah, I haven't had the opportunity to work with. Uh, but these are some really talented young students, uh, and they can tell you maybe a little bit more about themselves and about their experience in these classes. Sarah, we'll let you start. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I'm a junior from DC, or just outside of DC. And um, I, have, I was originally a chemistry major, 
and came in and now I'm also a biology double major because in learning in these classes I found that um, I had this new enthusiasm and interest and this just engaging um, structure and so I am now a double major <laughs> in these fields and I currently teach SI in the Bio 101. So I've had the privilege this semester of seeing this whole structured classroom from the opposite side and really understanding what I felt and the reason that I felt that when I was in the structured class. Um, so do you want me to continue or? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dennis Mitchell. I am a junior. Um, originally I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, and my story is, so actually in high school I didn't really have any science courses at all um, until I came to UNC. And the funniest thing was everybody was like, you know, they're just really hard. And I took my first one and it was pretty hard. But I've learned that the active learning that I, for example, I'm in Dr. Crimmins' class right now, and it really, it helps you learn the material, but it also helps you apply it in real life, and that's where we're getting examined on. Like, I had an exam yesterday, so hopefully it went pretty well. <laughs> but um, not just that, but it, it also is, is it showed me what de really determination is and being able to overcome even when your back is against the wall. And you really, when you're in these classes, you build a community, not only with the people around you, but everybody in your class is a community as well because you're all going through the same thing. So it also has helped me become a better person along the way. So. Hi, I'm Tatiana. Um, I'm a junior biology major here. Um, and my first experience, experience with these classes was I actually, as a freshman, I was in Dr. Hogan's Bio 101 course, and it was my first experience with the whole flipped classroom and the poll everywhere and the guided readings. And as a freshman, not really knowing how to read textbooks and know, knowing what to focus on, it really helped me, like, um, like really study what's important and get the big picture and apply it to the... Um, you know, the stuff she was going to exam us on and the stuff that um, is actually going to be relevant other than the kind of my, minute details. And it also helped me build friendships with other students that I still am friends with today because you build a community and everyone's kind of talking things out in class and um, trying to understand it. And then she also walked around and helped you if you were, like, lost. So it was, it was really beneficial and it helped me not kind of lock up and get scared of the course and drop, drop out of the course, so, yeah. Well, I guess there's a couple of things I could say. And one is we just get the word out, how this is working and what we're doing here, right? We, we publicize what we're doing, how well it's working, and make sure that the community and our recruiters that are going out to talk to students know how well this is working and, and know that our success rates for STEM graduation are better than in other places. Uh, Kelly, you have any thoughts? 
Um, I think that's what our AAU grant is a lot about, is we have the evidence now that it's working. The hard thing is how do we spread it among faculty? How do we change the culture? It does take time, it takes effort, and it takes people knowledgeable to train other faculty to do this. So I think we need resources, support, and time. Mike, Chuck Wade. Sure, that, that's a great question. And this is a program that's been, in chemistry at least, I can, I can speak to what's going on in chemistry. What we've done is create an actual course, which is this undergraduate mentor course that they can either get one or two credit hours for completing. And we get these students by sending out emails to the high performing students in the previous courses to try to identify some that might be interested in it. And this fall, we have 75 undergraduates working as undergraduate mentors in, in Chem 101, 102, Chem 261, and 262. That's general chemistry and organic chemistry. So they come to the class. They come to every class. They walk around. They interact. And many of them pair up to do evening Q&A sessions for students that have questions. And then once every two weeks, they meet as a class uh, for an hour with Dr. Jen Crumper and Dr. Carrie Beth Bleem, who actually run this course, and they talk about active learning strategies and how to ask, ask the right kinds of questions of students and talk about innovative ways of doing these things. And so we bring them together to talk to them about how they do that. Kelly, you want to mention that too? I just want to add, in biology we do it a little bit differently, but we have one of the mentors here with us so we can let her speak. Um, Sarah is a Colonel Robinson STEM scholar. Um, and she's a mentee of mine, so it was easy to fall into um, a rhythm with her. But I'll let her explain what I think is a high-impact practice for her being a teacher. Yeah, so I originally took Bio 101 and Bio 202 with Dr. Hogan um, and really enjoyed her courses and then proceeded to take other courses. And now as a junior, I am back in the classroom that I was in the fall of my freshman year. Um, and so I attend class so that I know what's going on in class. And during class, like the chem mentors, I also kind of roam around and talk to people as they're having their discussions. Um, then twice a week, I teach a one to two hour <laughs> review session where we kind of go over the same material that was gone over in class but maybe we step it back down slightly. So if it's super active and analyzation, then we come to the review session and we say, okay, where were the gaps that you found in class today where you couldn't connect what you had in your homework to the level that she was expecting in class? And let's talk about that gap. Um, and so that then everyone is caught back up to date and enter into the next class feeling like, okay, I have this, I understand. Um, and we also do some practice test questions and some further analyzation. And I've found that students are incredibly engaged. Um, the community that is formed in the 450 plus person lecture, um, those same students that I see discussing together in class show up to SI together. Um, and they come with questions and I know that outside of the class they're studying together and so they've formed these groups and I really encourage that as a way to study. Um, and then lastly, I have had a lot of students come up and ask me about the biology major and say, hi, I didn't know that I liked this. And, <laughs> and, and I think I do. Um, and that is really cool to see these people being inspired by these classes and realizing that it's not just what you learn in the textbook, but actually it applies to real life and we're applying it to real life every day in class. So that's been really cool. Mike, Mike and Kelly, um, this is incredibly exciting. Um, and Mike, as you know, I spent my career as a chemist in, in industry and hired quite a number of scientists uh, over the years. And uh, this has been a concern that, that I've had for decades and, and, and many of my um, uh, friends in industry and other folks that have built and owned companies have had executives had, had concern about. And you're addressing an incredibly important issue uh, in a number of, number, a number of ways. Um, and so getting more students and kids excited about science and, and wanting to pursue the careers is just absolutely, absolutely wonderful. But 
can you translate this to high school? Can you, can you move this into the high schools to get more kids excited at that level who want to come to college predisposed to get into science and, and so forth? I, I think it's easier to do it in high school because you you've got smaller classes, right? The smaller classroom and the more flexible classroom in terms of moving desks around is much more amenable to active learning. Doing it in the really large lecture halls is the really harder part because the, the spaces aren't configured to do this properly. And so we're kind of putting a square peg into a round hole in these large lecture classes. But in high school, I think it's very doable. Well, let me plant the seed for Carolina. This is a way that we can lead in the state of North Carolina if we can figure out how to take what we do here and apply it not only for ourselves and for our students and whatnot, but if we could apply it into the state of North Carolina, into our 100 counties, uh, I think that would be a wonderful gift to our state. I can also add that after some of the press with my work, um, I was contacted by the chair at Wake Tech Community College, and they want to do a replication study. So I think we'll see this spread out, too, to our community colleges. Um, Mike, you, you brought up a real interesting point is, um, is the infrastructure. Um, and we have all these lecture halls uh, with blackboards, uh, even at some buildings that have been built in the last 15 years have replicated blackboards um, and fixed seating. And so uh, really both for the students and the uh, faculty, I'd like to understand what, what adjustments do we need to make in physical infrastructure, IT infrastructure, and kind of just the whole management uh, infrastructure uh, but I'd love to hear it from both groups. What changes do we need to make? I think um, you could arrange the um, classrooms in more of like groups. Because in high school and teachers that did do this like learning, we would sat in like groups of four mm -hmm. and we would talk to each other and then she would come and ask us what we thought about what we were learning. So I think groups groups, and um, I guess the technology is good. So. so if you want to see what the best way to do it is, go to the physics department. The college has redesigned a couple of classrooms in the Department of Physics so they can do their studio format. And these have round tables that each have about nine students at the round tables. And they have two classrooms of 45 students each. And so it's relatively small at this point. But places like the University of Minnesota have major classroom facilities that have these studio models built into classrooms, and so they can be done on massive scales. And that's a big project for us because we haven't thought about that until very recently. The balance of um, support and education and that these students are successful, if I'm hearing correctly, not only with technology, but the mentoring. And so funding both is so important when we make these cuts because to just keep a classroom doesn't keep the support that's necessary. So I think what you're doing is a great model. Thank you for what you're doing. And I hope we will take it out, outside of our One quick comment on the um, physical space. Uh, the online task force of the provost had um, given this kind of charge to explore everything around online pure learning and uh, flipped classroom and how residential and online intersect. And I'm not sure if the report is out yet, but it is very soon coming, something I've mentioned a couple times. Um, they dive into that issue. And you know, in terms of physical space, in terms of uh, funding for professors and for instructional assistance and for student mentors and kind of all those different things. So um, we'll definitely dive into that once, once we have that to explore all the possibilities of how we can support this systemically. This is just fantastic. I, I'm really excited about a couple quick things. You know, we did use FNA last year to help renovate classes. So this is a case where we are trying to do that, and I think you just brought up such great things. It's also another example where excellence comes because you have faculty with great ideas, and they were able to get the external support to really add that benefit and, and really bring that innovation. And then, of course, 
we get to see the students who are the true uh, examples of what can, can really happen, and it, it's just fantastic for us. My, my last uh, quick question, and I want to also mention, when you read about disruption, I think you're seeing the future of great education right here today. This, this is it, and thank you. That, this is what it really means. So it's, it's wonderful to have that. So I was just going to ask you one more time, because we talk about the students that come in liking STEM, how good this is. I was actually an art major and an English major before I became a biology major, and actually Orgo was one of the classes that brought me in. But how have you been talking to friends? I mean, do you think that we get out even on our own campus? Do we have the capacity to bring people in who didn't think they were interested in STEM? And how can we do that better? Because this is a great opportunity for us. Um, it's, it's actually kind of funny because um, it was this year that I actually decided to change my major to chemistry. And um, I just realized that I just, it, was, it, was, it wasn't just the structure of the class, but also because I actually have professors that really care about me learning. Um, so I, I think that when it comes to spreading the word, I, I spread the word to everybody. Me personally, like I, I, would, I would tell my friends, you know, uh, take it. I love it. If there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. I, I, there's a lot of my friends that do the same thing along the way. So I think that especially for students that really enjoy the class, we definitely spread you know, our love of science around with others who may not be interested. And as a result, people like me come out. Can I just mention one thing uh, in, in conjunction with all of this, which I think is, is just fantastic. But I think it also underscores the necessity to keep trying new things and, and recognizing that not everything we try is going to work. And we should, in some cases, celebrate our failures almost as much as we celebrate our successes. And what, in, for, for example, in our organization, innovation is the lifeblood of our firm. And this issue around success and failure is, almost gets equal credit because we want people to try new things. And in the competitive environment in which we operate today, we have to be able to distinguish ourselves by making those great discoveries on the one hand, but also informing the future with our failures. So I just think continuing to push. And I applaud Karen and, and I applaud Carol for making it an continuing to create an environment where people are prepared to take a risk because there has to be some risk taking to be able to enable us to go forward with these things. Thank you. Thank you all so much.